All right. Well, I'm glad you're here, and I believe there's probably people still on their way, and there are people watching online. So are you ready for the word? All right. So Rick and Rebecca? Just, just Rick today. Okay. All right. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad y'all are here. And uh, I tell you, God wants to make a difference in your life today. Amen. You know, when we hear the Word of God preached, we're expecting Him to do something in our lives, not just hear the Word to hear the Word and walk away and have that box checked. When I come to church, I expect for my life to be changed, whether I'm ministering or not. So I just want to encourage you to expect God to actually minister to you in your life today. Amen. So let's pray before we get started. If you would, just pray with me. Father, I just thank you for today, this opportunity to come together and to hear your Word. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would touch the the heart of each and every person here and change our lives in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, this message I'm ministering today, I'm calling this the needed thing, the needed thing. And uh, this is really a simple message. It's a simple message, but I believe it's a very powerful message. And I really believe that, and I think you'll see in the word as we go along today, that what I'm going to be talking about is the key to manifesting and experiencing the promises of God in your life. You know, I believe we all want to manifest and see the promises of God. If we were, you know, honest with ourselves, and I think we are, we would um, realize, man, there are promises. There are things I see in the Bible that I haven't necessarily experienced the fullness of in my life. And we can have that. God intends for us to have that. God intends for you to have that. So I believe what I'm going to be talking about today is something that can really help you with that. Okay? So I want to go to 2 Corinthians 11 and read verses 2 through 3. And um, um, I'm not sure if the scriptures will be up here or not. But uh, anyway, if you want to turn with me, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 3. So listen to this. Again, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 3. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he says this, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I want you to notice that phrase, betrothed you to one husband. You know, God intends, and the Apostle Paul is bringing out here, that we have like a family-like relationship with God. We're part of the family of God. Amen? How many of you, if you, uh, you know, go to your home where your family is or whatever, you have what they call refrigerator rights? You get to go in the ref refrigerator and get whatever you want. Is that right? Sure you do. You know, we have, I'm going to tell you, whether we realize it or not or whether we take advantage of it or not, we have refrigerator rights with God. Amen. You have refrigerated rights with God. So he's betrothed you to one husband. And think about a relationship between a husband and wife. That's like the closest family relationship you can have. So our relationship with God is intended to be a very close relationship. Amen. So next verse says, But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. That's in Christ. Think about this intimate relationship we're supposed to have with God. Compare it to a marriage relationship. You know, when I go into covenant with Rebecca, we did the singles conference yesterday and talked a little bit about this kind of stuff. But when I go into a covenant a marriage relationship with Rebecca, Rebecca, everything I have becomes hers and everything she has becomes mine. Uh, and it's, it's hers just like it's mine. Amen? Yeah. That could be good or bad, right? So when we... And I'll talk more about this in a minute. But when we go into a relationship with God, everything he has is ours. Not just for the hereafter, but for the here and now. And you're going to see this in the word of God. And we can experience what God has for us this side of heaven. And again, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That word simplicity there, I'll look up the definition of that in the Greek. It means, it means simplicity, but really other meanings of that word are sincerity, generosity, and bountifulness. Think about this. When we go into a relationship with God, there's a simplicity of that relationship maybe, but there's a sincerity of it. He really does love you. He's not just saying that. And he really is generous, and he really is bountiful. He'll share with you whatever he has, and he's got lots of it. 
Amen. And it's not just about the stuff. I don't want you to think that. But think of what he's saying here. I fear lest somehow the serpent deceived Eve. You know, the world and the devil. We have an adversary of the devil, right? That's trying to distract us from what belongs to us in Christ. Amen. Simplicity. You know, there's a difference between religion and Christianity. Amen. Really, and just a simple way to look at it is religion is man's attempt to reach God. And Christianity is God reaching out to man in Christ. Amen. And all the religions of the world fall short because they're all about works and men earning their way into God's graces by works. Okay. Christians, we're not doing that. We're not, we receive, Jesus did the work. He hung on the cross and said it's finished. And now we receive the finished work by faith, by putting our faith in him as our Savior. Amen. We can't, be, we can't save ourselves. We need a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. He paid it in full. We just have to believe it and receive it. Okay. So I'm really talking about the needed thing. I'm talking about relationship. Relationship. So I want to go to a familiar scripture and take a new look at it. John 3.16. John 3 16 okay and again this is a familiar scripture John 3 16 it says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life again that's a familiar scripture but I think sometimes we miss what it's saying okay Jesus came and died for two reasons this tells us he came and paid that price for two reasons. One is so we wouldn't perish, and the second is so we would have something called everlasting life. And really, that's the main goal. We won't perish, but we'll have everlasting life. You know, Jesus didn't, he came to pay for our sins, but the purpose of the payment of sins wasn't just to have our sins paid for. The purpose of the payment of sins was this thing called everlasting life. Okay, sin, the forgiveness of sin was, is really just something that was necessary to be dealt with to get us into everlasting life. Thank God for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, but the main goal was everlasting life. All right, now think about this. We, wanna, we, we don't want to miss the primary thing by looking at a byproduct. Okay, imagine this. Maybe when you were growing up, you walked into your home when you were a kid and you smelled cookies bacon. Maybe your mom was making chocolate chip cookies and they're in the oven and you could smell those cookies, right? And that smell is awesome. But are you going to be satisfied with just the smell? If you just enjoy the smell, really you're, you're missing the, the smell. is awesome. It's great. But you're missing the main point. The main point is these cookies are for eating and you want to dig in, right? <laughs> Think about that. If we just get saved to miss hell for the forgiveness of sins, we're really missing the main point. The main point is something more. The main point is it's eternal life. That's the main point, okay? So what is everlasting life? What is eternal life? I'm going to go to John 17. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. This is when Jesus was praying right before the garden of, uh, uh, this is, he's in, right before he was uh, not taken, but before he went with the soldiers in the garden of Gethsemane. He's praying, though. So John 17, 1 through 3, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to his, as you have given him. Verse 3 goes on and says, and this is eternal life. There's the question. What's eternal life? He says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life, now think about this. We tend to think of eternal, we, we, not us here, surely, but other people think that Jesus came just for the forgiveness of sins, right? Well, we already saw now that really that was just something that had to be done to get us into eternal life. So we think eternal life then typically is just living forever. Do you realize everybody's going everybody's gonna to exist forever? Hitler's going to exist forever, and I, I'm not judging him. I don't know where he is. I could take a guess, but I, Osama bin Laden, 
Billy Graham. They're going to, Kenneth Hagin. They're going to, ever, they're going to live forever. They're going to exist forever. Let's put it that way. Some are going to live forever, and some are going to die forever. Think about that. Eternal life is knowing God. It's relationship with God. That is eternal life. Amen. Death, death is separation from God. It's a horrifying thought to think of eternal separation from, from God. Jude calls it darkest blackness. That's, man. Anyway, this is um, the key point I want to make here is knowing God. That word, when it says there, you know, he says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That word know there is talking about an intimate relationship, really knowing someone. You know, when we teach on intimacy in marriage, we're talking about to know somebody's deepest nature. To know someone's deepest nature. So there's more than just when Jesus came and paid the price for the forgiveness of your sins and you put your faith in Jesus and got saved. If that's all we do, if we stop there and don't go on to grow in relationship with the Lord, to get to know God, to know his deepest nature, to understand his love, and that's a, a constant thing. I'm not all the way there with understanding his love yet. I don't think we'll ever be all the way there with knowing these things. It's a constant growth process and knowing him better. But if we don't go on to knowing him better, we're really missing the main point. It's like walking in smelling the cookies but not eating them. We walk in and get the forgiveness, but we don't partake in knowing God. There's a relationship to have. Eternal life is knowing God. It's an intimate relationship. Amen? It's an intimate relationship. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And again, when we come into relationship with God, everything God has is yours. Now. Not in the sweet by and by. How is it Andrew Womack says that he says it's not pie in the sweet by and by or something, steak on the plate while you wait. literally gave his life for you to give his life to you think of that he gave his life for you to give his life to you everything god has is yours that's how covenant works marriage covenant hers is mine and mine's hers and the covenant with god everything he has is ours you know we have a salvation package a lot of times we think of salvation as just the forgiveness of sins but when jesus what the what he paid for us to have includes healing includes provision it includes peace it really the main thing it includes is relationship with him and i guess my main point today is if we will focus on that relationship with him and seek him and not be um as it said up there uh deceived and led away from the simplicity that's in christ if we'll keep fo our focus on him we really don't even have to worry about the healing and peace and provision and all the other benefits of our salvation because he's the source of all that amen when does eternal life start when you, it doesn't start when you this physical body dies eternal life starts the moment you put your faith in christ that's when everything becomes yours that's when eternal life starts now think of this ephesians 1 3 let me turn over there real quick i want to read that i'm going the wrong way this is one of my favorite scriptures, Ephesians 1, 3. And it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That's past tense, already done. What that's saying is every blessing heaven has to offer is yours right now. Every, so what's heaven got to offer? It'd be easier to list what it doesn't have to offer. It doesn't have condemnation. It doesn't have deception. It doesn't have hell. It doesn't, it's got healing and provision and peace and joy and relationship with God. It's just all these benefits of our relationship with God. Think of it this way. Suppose I actually did this in a, a service I was doing one time. I had like this jar of marbles. And suppose marbles are you know, the, the blessings. Each marble is a blessing. Well, if I stand here and we're on like a carpet of floor, if I, if I poured the marbles out right here, some would roll away, but where's the greatest concentration going to be? Near me, 
Is that right? So you could be far away from me, and you might be able to get a marble. You might be able to get a blessing. You know, there might be some out there by the grace of God. But if you really want to get the concentration of the marbles, which are standing for the blessings here, where are they going to be? Closer to me. They're going to be nearer to me. Think about in your relationship with God. Draw near to me, and, and I'll draw near to you, he said. Amen? Knowing God will produce fruit in your life, and that knowing isn't just getting saved. It's going on to learn his deepest nature, to actually build. He is a personality. God's actually funny. He can be funny, you know? Yeah. And... <laughs> And he, anyway, it's, God's just awesome. He'll, he'll, he'll talk to you. He will converse with you. You can have relationship with God. And he's really smart. It's a, yeah. He really is smart. And he knows exactly what you're going through. He hasn't missed anything. And he's not worried about it at all. Think about that. Yeah, you know, actually, that, that lack of worry, that's like a, that's a marble, a blessing. Be anxious for nothing. As we draw nearer to him, these things just begin to fall away. Yeah, you know, I talked about knowing God's deepest nature. His nature is love. God is love, right? And the Bible says in 1 John 4, 18, that perfect love, his love, casts out fear. So as, as we know him... Know his deepest nature, begin to understand more and more his love for us, his commitment to us. His at, he, he is so committed to you, he would even die for you. Oh, he did that. Did you know that if you were the only person that needed a Savior, if every, if I, there's like 7 billion people on earth, if 6 billion, 999, whatever, 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 if all them were good and you were the only one that needed a Savior, Jesus would have came and paid that entire price just for you. He'd have done the entire thing just for you. That's how valuable, that's how much he loves you. That's how valuable you are to him. That's what the parable of the, the 100 sheep's about. You know the parable? Some people call it the parable of the 99 sheep. There's 99 that are found and one that's lost. And the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes to look for the one. That's what that's about. If you were the only one that needed that, he'd pay that entire price just for you. That's awesome to think about. That's how much he loves you. And oh man, I think about, we talked about it yesterday, how, how the Lord said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Man, every one of us here is just incredibly valuable to the Lord. And we should value each other as well. Amen. So every blessing heaven has to offer is, you, is yours. We really need to move God right to the center of our lives. And I think we know this, but we don't necessarily know this, if that makes sense. And we know this, but maybe we don't know this. We just need to move God right to the center of our lives. And I don't know about you, but I'm stepping on my own toes up here. Okay? So if I'm stepping on yours, you're not the only one. But we need to move him to the center of our lives and fill our mind with him and hang on like a bulldog. I was driving by this house one time. Maybe some of you have seen this. You know, pit bull. There was this rope hanging from a tree and a big knot on the end of that rope. And that rope, the knot was about maybe this high off the ground. And there was a bulldog hanging off of that knot. His feet were off the ground. That dog had just leaped and grabbed that knot and was just hanging there. Has anybody ever seen anything like this? When I saw that, I saw, that dog was just hanging there. You didn't have very powerful jaws. I thought, I say I thought, it was probably the Lord. That's how we need to hang on to God. Just grab a hold and just don't let go. As far as seeking him and our relationship with him. But, you know, just like it said over here, there, there's a world and a devil as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. So our minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Can it really be so simple that if I'll just focus on the relationship with God, that he'll do the rest? Think about it. But the world and the devil are desperately trying to get our focus off of him and onto ourselves and our problem. There's. The temptations come along, 
temptations to sin, whatever it is, you know, bad things and not so bad things like worries and things like that and just circumstances and things that come at us. Try to get our focus off the Lord and on those things, right? So suppose I had a jar of marbles and you, you come to me and, you know, you enter into a relationship with me. I'm just compare this to God now. He's got all the marbles, right? He's the source of all the marbles of the blessings, whether it's peace, forgiveness, unity, for healing, provision, whatever it is, and I just hand you the whole jar of marbles. Well, now you've got all the everything I have is yours. You've got it all, right? And then what happens? We walk away with our jar of marbles, and so we've got everything, and we start looking, like looking around, looking for marbles. You've got it. We've already got it. I don't know if I'm making sense. You've already got it. We don't need to go. We got relationship with God. We got everything. We just need to seek Him. Is that making sense? We need to seek him. See, this is a simple message. It really is. But we start looking at things like, you know, man, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? <laughs> right? Let's go. I'm going to go to Luke 10, 38 through 42. And we see this. The Bible shows us this. This is uh, really where the title of the message come from, comes from, the needed thing. Now, it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain wo woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted. With, she was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? You need to be distracted too. She needs to be distracted too. Right? Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. When God says your name twice, it's usually not a good thing. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. One, how many things? One. I looked this up in the Greek. You know, the New Testament was written in Greek. I looked up this phrase right here, the one thing is needed. And in the Greek it says one thing is needed. <laughs> okay? But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. We need to focus on him. Do you see this? Eternal life is knowing God. We need to put our focus on him. You know, Mary was focused on Jesus and not on all the distractions, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. He says only one thing is needed, and that's the key to getting the rest. Jesus had fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000. All the things he did, you know, you know what you know, Jesus did. He did all these things. Do you think that Martha had a problem that Jesus couldn't handle? I doubt it. I don't think so. Amen? Really what was going on is Martha was dependent on herself. She was dependent on herself to meet the needs. Man, we get into that. I get into that. Dependent on myself to meet my needs or to meet the needs around me or whatever. Well, how, how did Jesus deal with those situations? He depended on God and his relationship with God. Amen? What should we do? How many Christians today bring Jesus into their house, Martha brought him into her house, bring him into their lives, and occupy ourselves with something else? I'm sure none of us here do that, but some people do. People out there. The good part is focusing on him above, above everything else. And we see this again. Matthew 14, 27 through 31. You'll be familiar with this. The, the disciples are in a, in a storm on the water and Jesus comes walking to them in verse 27 it says but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying be of good cheer it is I if you actually now if you read that in the Greek he said I am <laughs> anyway he said it is I do not be afraid verse 28 and Peter answered him and said Lord if it is you command me to come to you on the water verse 29 so he said Jesus said come and when Peter had come down out of the boat he walked on the water to go to Jesus there's power in the word. What God, we got a whole book full of promises here. There's power in the word to accomplish what it says, okay? So, 
Peter trusted Jesus. He had a relationship with Jesus. He steps out of the boat and starts walking on the water. There's power in the Word to overcome whatever we're facing. All right? Verse 30, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous. Now think about that just a second. How did Peter see that the wind was boisterous? He looked away from Jesus. Right? If I'm just looking at Rebecca, how am I going to see that the wind's boisterous out here? I have to look away. That was his mistake. He looked away. <laughs> he saw the wind was boisterous. He was afraid and beginning to sink. He didn't begin to sink until he looked away from the Lord. He took his eyes off the, the word. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. Now think about that. Immediately. He didn't let him drown a little bit. <laughs> right? He immediately reached out his hand and saved him. He who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you make a mistake, get your focus back on the Lord. Right? Immediately he stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Think about this. O oh, you of little faith. A little faith is evidently enough faith to walk on water if your focus is on Jesus. Think about it. That's awesome to me. There's hope for me. If you get your focus off the Lord, get it back on him. Amen. Like Jesus, Peter started to sink. He realized, hey, this ain't working anymore. So the guy's focused back on Jesus. Lord save me. Jesus did, right? So to walk on water, one thing is needed. Focus on Jesus. Not on distractions, not on circumstances, not whatever's going on around us. A lot of Christians, we step out and we do what Jesus said to do. Define the circumstances. I'm sure people here have done it. Maybe every one of us at some point in our lives has stepped out doing something the Lord said to do. We're doing good. And then we start thinking, oh, well, what if? What if? And then things not begin not maybe to go so well. And we decide that the thing that got us out there can't see us through. And the thing that got you out there can see you through. Get your focus back on him. Keep walking. Amen. If Peter hadn't got his focus off the Lord, I guess he'd still be walking, right? You know, Hebrews, we won't, I won't turn over there and read the whole thing, but Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 tells us to run our race, or you could say live our lives, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Run your life, I mean run your race, or you could say live your life, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. It doesn't say glancing at him once in a while, does it? We need to live our life looking unto him, focusing on him. Amen. Everybody Okay. All right, I'm going to read kind of a long section of Scripture here. And I want to read this because a lot of times we've, it's, I'm going to go to Matthew 6. A lot, of times, a lot of times we focus on the end of this chapter where Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We focus on the end of the chapter, but really the, it really gives us context if we start earlier and look at what he's saying. So I'm going to go to Matthew 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single... What's that mean? Looking at one thing. If the, therefore your eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. Okay? Light, truth, prosperity, health, joy. Okay? Those types of things. But if thine eye be evil, what that means is you're, you're distracted by a lot of stuff. Okay? That don't mean you got an ugly eye or a stink eye or whatever. It means your eyes, is, an evil eye is one that's just, you know, distracted. Okay? So, but if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. Deception, lack, sickness, it's going to hinder us from receiving what God has for us for our eyes evil. So we want to be single in our focus on the Lord and not distracted and focused on a bunch of other stuff. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he should, will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So we can't focus on money and God. It's not going to work. We need to focus on what? God. Right? That's what he's saying there. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. Take no thought. How many? None. Take no thought. For your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor, what, nor for your body, what you shall put on. It's not, is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment or clothing. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. That's true. They don't. 
right? Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. That's an amazing statement. Solomon, the richest man who ever lived, who had the, the whole nation of Israel as a result, they were so wealthy, it says in the Bible, that, that silver was as common as dust. They would haul silver outside the city and dump it. That's amazing. But it says here, Solomon wasn't arrayed like one of God's flowers. Those flowers aren't worried about what they're going to wear. We're more valuable than a flower, right? Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Ouch. Ow. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Or whatever it is. Whatever it is that situation is distracting us and pulling our focus away from the Lord. Whatever it is. He's just giving some examples here. So what happens? That morning, somebody's on the shore and says, Hey, fellas, you caught anything? It's Jesus. Don't you think Jesus knew they hadn't caught anything? John says, It's the Lord. So Peter dives in the water, swims in. The rest of them bring the boat in. Peter's kind of a rash guy, right? And Peter comes up on the shore, drags the net up. The boat comes in. And what's Jesus got over here on the fire? Fish. Already cooked and bread. The very thing Peter thought he needed to go get. There's a resurrected Jesus out there. And Peter's going fishing. And the very thing he wanted to get, some fish, Jesus already had it. And better, it was already cooked. And bread. He would have saved himself and all those other guys a whole lot of trouble if he just went looking for Jesus. God's no respecter of persons. What he did for them, he'll do for us today. Amen? Think about this. Mark 3, 14. This is awesome scripture too. 
Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And in verse 15 goes on and says, and to have power and to heal the sick and to cast out devils. Notice the first thing. Did you catch the first thing that he called the 12 to him for? To be with him. He didn't call them so he could send them out to preach. That wasn't the first thing. He didn't call them to have power and so they cast out devils and healed the sick. He called them to be with him. And a byproduct of being with him, that relationship with him, was he gave them something to do. I want you to go minister to these people over here. And while you're there, cast out the devils and heal the sick. And you're going to have power to do this. It was a byproduct of relationship with him. He's still calling people. He's speaking to you right now. He's calling you. He's called you to be with him. Man, we think, oh, God's called me to do all this. And there, he's probably, got, I'm sure he does have things for you to do, but that's not the point. The point's relationship. Amen? It's relationship. That's number one, relationship. He wanted them to be with him. Just like he wanted the 12 to be with him, he wants you to be with him. Amen? That was the important thing. They were more important than what they did. You're more important than what you do. Now, doing's important. If God tells us to do something, we ought to do it. We have a job as, you know, as just by being virtue of being part of the body of Christ. We have a, a, a position. We have a job, something he wants us to do, and we ought to do that, but not to the neglect of relationship with him. Amen? Eternal life is knowing God and knowing Jesus. And a lot of times, Christians who have all the marbles... You haven't lost your marbles. Christians who have all the marbles, we, we sit around with our minds occupied with getting by. How am I going to get by? How am I going to make it? We're worried about all these things. And saying, stop worrying about that stuff. Focus on me. Whatever circumstance you're facing, you come to me. I had a fellow call me. This was a few years ago now. A guy called me, and he had... Uh, He'd had a rash over like 70% of his body for, I don't know, three weeks or something. It was like fiery and itching and red, just like, like I said, over 70% of his body. And he didn't know what it was. He'd been to the doctor. The doctor didn't they thought allergy, whatever. They didn't know what it was, and, and it wasn't going away. And I said, he asked me, you know, he was telling me about it, and I said, well, do you have any good worship music in your house? And he said, he thought, he thinks this is completely unrelated. I'm wanting help with this rash, and you're talking about worship music. Yeah, he said, well, yeah. I said, okay. Well, put on that. Here's what I want you to do. And don't call me complaining about this rash unless you do this. Put that worship music on, and you begin worshiping the Lord. And what's going to happen is eventually you're going to get your mind off yourself and off this rash and onto the Lord, and that's going to be a help to you. It's going to, I told him it was going to take care of the rash. So he did. To his credit, he did. He called me back a while later. And so he said it took about 45 minutes, but he began to worship the Lord, put his focus on the Lord. And somewhere between like maybe 30 minutes and 45, it started off, he's thinking, this is crazy. I'm, worship, I'm itching and burning. But somewhere in there, after worshiping God for a while, he began to get his focus off those circumstances and what was going on and get his focus on the Lord. And he said about 45 minutes into it, he just suddenly realized, wait a minute. I don't feel any itching and burning anymore. And he looked, and the rash was gone. Focusing on the Lord. I mean, he'd, he'd gone three weeks with that thing and didn't have to. Amen? We need to get our mind off ourselves and get our mind off our problems and get it on him. I'm going to end right here, but I want to end with a question. What's God saying to you? Because he's speaking to you. What's God saying to you? Think about that just a second. What is God saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? What's God saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? Make a decision. Like I said earlier, don't just let this be a message, man. I came to church, heard a message, checked that block done, went and got some barbecue or whatever, and you know, on with the next thing. Don't do that. I'm going to tell you, like I said earlier, this, it's a simple message. It really is. But I just really, really believe this is the key. We see these promises. 
we've got these circumstances. And there's this disconnect between I've got these promises and I've got these circumstances. Where do these things meet up? I believe that's right here is where they meet up. This is the answer to manifesting the promises in our lives and radically changing our circumstances. Amen? Amen. So y'all stand up. And Rebecca, you have anything? Okay, I just want to pray for you a second. I'm going to ask Pastor Ken to come back up. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for your word. Father, I pray in Jesus' name to help each one of us here. If you're not born again, you just need to, it's, it's so easy to get born again. Jesus loves you. I believe everybody here is born again. But if you're not, the word of God says to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Okay? 